This is the second video in the PM120 and PM130 calculation syllabus and in this movie we will be covering spectrophotometry and unit conversions. As with the previous video you should watch this movie prior to attending a tutor-led session where you will have the opportunity to work through the homework questions within this presentation and also to ask questions about areas that you have found confusing. So the first area that we're going to cover in this presentation is spectrophotometry. Now spectrophotometry is a widely used biochemical technique and it can be used to quantitate a diverse range of biochemical samples. Indeed many of you will have already used this technique as part of 131 to calculate the amount of protein present in a series of unknown drinks using the absorption. Beyond that you can also identify and characterise molecules based on their structure as the absorption can change depending on what format a structure is in. Spectrophotometry is governed by two laws. The first of these laws is Beer's law which states that the higher the concentration the higher the absorbance and we can represent this visually using a dilution series. If you look at the sample on the left hand side there is a very deep blue colour as it's a very concentrated sample. This means that not a lot of light is going to pass through that sample because it will be absorbed by the sample. As you dilute the sample out moving from left to right the intensity of the blue colour drops so more and more light is able to pass through that sample until ultimately you get to the right hand side where you have a near colourless solution. Of course our eyes are actually seeing the light that is not absorbed so these are the colours that are reflected back to us whereas a spectrophotometer is actually measuring the amount of light that is absorbed as it passes through the sample. The second law is Lambert's law and this states that the greater the thickness the greater the absorption. Again we can represent this visually. If we have a sample of a known width as that light travels through that sample the further it goes through the sample the more light is absorbed. So the thicker the sample the greater the amount of light that is absorbed as it passes through. In practice however the path length or the distance the light travels is normally one and this is because the cuvettes that you use have a specially designed width of one centimeter. Combining these two laws together you get Beer's Lambert's law which states that A equals epsilon CL where A is the absorption at a given wavelength, epsilon is the molar absorption coefficient, C is a concentration and L is the path length. Absorption does not have units so it is normally represented as AU meaning arbitrary units. The molar absorption coefficient has units of litres per mole per centimetre. Concentration has to be given as a molarity and the path length is in centimetres but as we previously defined this is normally one due to the design of the curvettes. Some of you may prefer this representation using this triangle so if we want to solve for A we would multiply epsilon, C and L together because they are on the bottom of the triangle and you can use this triangle to rearrange to find for any of the components of this equation. So how does a spectrophotometer determine what the absorbance is? Well a beam of light is fired at a sample and has a known intensity which is I0. The properties of the sample that the light passes through, so the concentration, the molar absorption coefficient and the path length will cause a decrease in the amount of light that comes out on the other side of the sample which is I1 and it's this change that actually gives us a representation of absorbance. So the absorbance is equal to the log of the intensity of light entering the sample divided by the intensity of the light leaving the sample and this is dependent on epsilon C L. As we have just defined the absorbance is measured in arbitrary units not nanometers. However it is common practice to advise readers what wavelength has been used in order to measure your absorbances by labeling an axis with A X X X where the three axes represent the wavelength in nanometers used to measure the absorbance. So for example you may lab label an axis with absorbance A595 which would tell readers that all those readings were taken at 595 nanometers. 
The reason that it's important to do this is firstly so that experiments can be replicated, but also because substances will have an absorption spectra, such as the one shown on the right here. Depending on what wavelength you actually take your readings at, you will either have a very high or a very low percentage absorption. So it's important that the experiments can be replicated and you use an appropriate wavelength for the sample that you are uh, trying to measure. Another common confusion among students is nanometers and nanomolar. The two are not interchangeable. And obviously nanometer is a measure of size or distance and nanomolar is a measure of concentration. So please take care not to confuse the two. Epsilon, or the molar absorption coefficient, is an intrinsic property of a given chemical species. It's a measure of how strongly a chemical species absorbs light at a given wavelength. And it's important that when you actually are given epsilon, that you match the absorption you measure at to that given wavelength, because the absorption coefficient will change depending on the wavelength. As we defined, the units of epsilon are litres per mole per centimetre. You can use beer lamberts law and the molar absorption coefficients for quantitation. They can be used to create a calibration plot for unknown samples by plotting a standard curve of known standards and then using that to calculate the concentration of an unknown sample. There are a few guidelines to follow when you're creating a standard curve. Firstly, avoid very high and very low absorbances. The best results are obtained when the absorbance is between 0.1 and 1 arbitrary unit. You then need to plot the absorbance against the concentration, such as in this standard curve here. On the x-axis, we have concentration in milligrams per milliliter. So this is what you have actually changed in your standards. And what you measure is the absorbance, which in this case we are measuring at 595 nanometers. As you can see, as the intensity of the colour and therefore the concentration of the sample increases, the absorption increases. Now there are two ways that you can use this standard curve to calculate the concentration of an unknown. You could read directly off the graph by measuring your unknown sample, recording the absorption, and then taking that from the y and the x-axis respectively. Or you can calculate the gradient of the curve in the format y equals mx plus c and rearrange for x in order to find the concentration. Beer-Lambert's law is normally used by measuring the absorption and then determining the concentration of an unknown. Beer-Lambert's law can be arranged from a equals epsilon cl and if you divide both sides by epsilon, you will get A divided by epsilon equals CL. And therefore, in order to find for concentration, we divide both sides by L, giving us C equals A divided by epsilon L. And you can simply plug in the values that you take from your spectrophotometer, along with the molar absorption coefficient at that wavelength, in order to calculate the concentration of your unknown sample. An example of this is if we have a molar absorption coefficient of NADH at 340 nanometers is 62200 liters per mole per centimeter. So if I were to take a sample of NADH and measure the absorbance at 0 0.386, what is the concentration of NADH in that sample? Taking beer lamberts law, we rearrange it for concentration as we defined on the previous slide and then put in the numbers that we have been given. So the absorption was 0 0.386, and this is divided by the molar absorption coefficient, which is 62200, multiplied by the path length, which is one centimeter. And that gives us a concentration of NADH in that sample of 0 0.0000621 molar. Of course, that's not a very easy way of writing that value. So a much simpler format would be 6.21 micromolar. Now that brings us very nicely onto the second part of this presentation, which is units and unit conversions. Hopefully you will have come across some of these prefixes already at A-level, but a kilo is essentially 1,000 times larger than a base unit. A base unit is 1,000 times larger than a milli unit, which is 1,000 times larger than a micro unit, which is a thousand times larger than a nano unit. So 
So therefore, 1,000 grams is the same as one kilogram. Likewise, one milliliter is the same as 1,000 microliters. And these prefixes can be used in front of all units. So for mass, you could have kilograms, micrograms, milligrams. You can use it in front of moles, or you can use it in front of molarity. So why do we use these? Well, if you look at this recipe for a buffer here, it actually looks quite difficult. It would be very, very easy to use 10 times too much or 10 times too little of one of the reagents simply by misreading the number of zeros present in the number. So it's much easier for us to write, make a buffer containing 6.2 micromolar X, 1.7 nanomolar Y, and 2.5 micromolar Z. So it makes this much simpler, and therefore you're much less likely to make mistakes in terms of actually breaking up these reagents. It's important that we are able to convert between units easily. If we start at the top with a kilo unit, one kilo unit would be equal to a thousand base units. So to go from kilo to the base unit, you would multiply by a thousand. So for example, one kilogram would be equal to 1000 grams. To move from the base unit to a milli unit, again, you multiply by a thousand. So one gram would be equal to 1000 milligrams. And likewise, you move down each time by multiplying by 1,000. So a milli unit is 1,000 micro units, and one micro unit is 1,000 nano units. To move the other way, you simply divide by 1,000. So 1,000 nano units would be equal to one micro unit, and so on as you move up. Another area that students can find confusing is unit equivalence. 0 0.25 molar means 0 0.25 moles per litre. But what happens if I wanted to represent that as millimoles per millilitre? Well, actually, it's the same. It's still 0 0.25 millimoles per millilitre. And we'll work through this in two steps. Firstly, I need to convert the number of moles to millimoles. If you remember, one mole is a thousand times larger than a millimole. So therefore, I will multiply by 1,000. So 0 0.25 multiplied by 1,000 gives me 250 millimoles per litre. But I wanted to express this as millimoles per millilitre. So therefore, I need to go from litres to millilitres. And to do this, I would actually divide by 1,000. And the reason for that is that a millilitre is 1,000 times smaller than a litre. So 250 divided by 1,000 equals 0 0.25 millimoles per milliliter. So actually, the two factors have cancelled each other out. Another example of this is volume factors and reciprocals. So 5 molar means 5 moles per litre. But how would this be expressed as moles per milliliter? The bit that you need to take care of here is considering the volumes. Which is larger, one litre or one milliliter? Well, hopefully from the previous slides, you will be all be able to tell me that one litre is a thousand times larger than one milliliter. So what you need to think here is, which will have a larger number of moles, one litre or one milliliter? And of course, the answer is that one litre will have a thousand times more moles than one milliliter. Therefore, converting from five moles per litre to moles per milliliter, you actually need to divide by 1,000. So 5 molar is equal to 5 moles per litre, which is equal to 0 0.005 moles per milliliter, or 5 times 10 to the 3 moles per milliliter. On the next few slides are some homework questions for you to try out the concepts that we have covered in this presentation. Go through the questions. You can, of course, pause the video in order to write down the information and bring those with you to your tutor-led session. In that session, the tutor will go through the questions with you and you will have an opportunity to ask the tutor about any gaps in your knowledge or any aspect of the presentation that you have found particularly confusing. The first series of questions is about Beer Lambert's Law. The second set of questions is about prefixes. And the third set of questions 
is about molarity and unit conversion. Thank you for listening.